Christmas just like that? Or yes, yes. Really? Yeah, there was there was like a party thing going on. Okay. Uh, and she comes over, and so they said, they're talking about how they, boy, if they, they get photos that are just right, she does look naked from, well, from the waist up. And they can release that to the media saying, this is the way his wife walks around in public in Washington, D.C. <laughs> They were looking at everything pretty sleazy, but once again, we're talking about Nixon, and Nixon did a lot of sleazy things. Yeah. Well, you know, one more thing, too, people need to remember is that at the night that Donna and Chappaquiddick, when Kenny is, is taking this girl off for a ride in the car, uh, and, and she left her purse behind, she left her keys behind, he wasn't driving to the hotel. Was, they were going to the cemetery to make out. But his yeah. wife was home with a difficult pregnancy, and she lost that baby because of all this uh, craziness that went on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's exactly. like two tragic deaths uh, out of this whole situation. Uh, Oh boy. Yeah. And you want to remember when Jackie Kennedy had a miscarriage. You wonder if that's because she heard about another incident regarding uh John Kennedy. Because he was he was just like it well, the all three all three of the brothers were the same. Mm. And uh you know, you wonder if that caused her a lot of emotional distress, which resulted in a miscarriage. Uh, but certainly this one here, Ted, is like said, his wife's at home and he's out. Well, this is a great time for me to go out and have a party with some young gals. Yeah, and, and they were all, all the men were married, all the young girls were single. Uh, you, you know, oh, yeah, uh, always. I just had on the show Bill Burns, you know, and he did a book about the Dr. Feelgood, uh, the doctor that was given the, um, the methamphetamine to, to Kennedy. Uh, did you hear anything about that? To which Kennedy? To, uh, Jack Kennedy. Oh, yeah, well. Oh, he was getting loads of things. I have a lot of his medical treatment. Uh, he was getting up to like six injections in his back per day. Wow. He was taking Demerol, basically like m ms And I have some of his conversations speaking to his White House physician about getting more pain pills. Um, and I tried to get his medical records, which are all within the National Archives but they're locked up tight because of the Kennedy family. And so I had a long discussion with the archivist there. So well, wait a minute, or the chief archivist said, here he is, he's the president. He's getting paid by the federal government. His medical care is being provided by the federal government as are his medications. That should be public information accessible. And they said, well, you can look at it, but you have to be a medical doctor or a P, have a PhD in the medical field. If not, you have to bring one with you to the National Archives. And before you can do that, you have to tell them why you want to look at those records and what the information is going to be used for. And they decide then if you can look at his medical records. And I've got some medical records from him. And quite frankly, Jack Kennedy was a drug addict. Yeah. Not using like heroin, street drugs, but from prescription. He was loaded all the time on pain pills, uh, Vicodin, Demerol, so forth, injections. And how he continued to function is quite frankly amazing. And I sent just the medical records that I had, what he was taking, his medication, to three different MDs that I know. And one guy has a lot to do with drug rehab and all that stuff. And they said... I don't know how he was alive with the amount that he was taking. And he probably certainly would have died from an overdose within a year or two. You know, so he had some real problems. And now let me ask you a question. Just, uh, do you actually visit the National Archives in person to get this stuff? Well, not. I generally don't go back. I've uh, A lot of it you can get online. A right. lot of it you can request. And generally what I do is uh, from sources that I have, and I have some pretty good sources within the National Archives. Okay. And they'll tell me about something. I'll file a Freedom of Information Act to get those documents. And I went to the National Archives out in Southern California before and uh, dug through them and uh, to like the Nixon Library and so forth. So there's a lot there if you know where to look. Um, and it's truly amazing what you can uncover. I mean, it's just it is astounding. But it helps to have guys on the inside tipping you off to what to look for, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That takes a, a long time. And yeah. I'll give you a real quick example. Uh, I, from a well-placed source within the military structure, let's put it that way, I heard about a um, a nuclear issue they had uh, when they were blown off, you know, nuclear weapons back 
out in the Pacific. And uh, I never heard of this one, uh, the code name. So that he gave me the code name. And I finally went to the National Archives in uh, California. They didn't know it. And then they pulled out a big box, just a cardboard box that gave it to me. So here you go, look through it. And I started going through it and here I found it and uh, the code name for it and everything. And what they did is, uh, it wasn't the first time, but they had blown off an atomic bomb. And before though, the weather people that were there said, hey, no, 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 the winds are gonna change direction. And so they said, ah, we can get off with it. We'll blow it up anyway. They blew it off. And all the the radioactive fallout fell on inhabited islands and on ships that were passing by. And uh, so it was all handled pretty much under the table. It was kept quiet. But what they decided with these particular islanders, there were, oh, maybe about 2,000 were, got a huge dose of radiation. They said, well, let's tell them we're going to give them medical care. There's nothing we can do for them, but let's watch them and see how to. Wow. Yeah, and so, I mean, there's loads of stuff like that, uh, but you just have to find it, uh, and you have to really dig and dig and dig. Uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating. The abuses that have gone on in, in our government, uh, you know, the, in the history books are not going to look kindly. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no, because you know? uh, no, I, have, I have one on, uh, I have uh, Bill Clinton's telephone conversation. Yeah, you were telling me, yeah, right, with the... Yeah, and they are still hiding. I mean, I've had them for years. And I want the follow up. And there's no doubt just reading this one document, his telephone transcript to the prime minister of Pakistan, he knew <clears throat> two major attacks were coming on the U.S. Because he told that he told the prime minister he was terrified. He wanted them to go in and knock off bin Laden. Hmm. And uh, they basically said in there, said, if this stuff happens, there's going to be worldwide retaliation. Right after that, I started checking, okay, what were the things that bin Laden did, terrorist attack? Right after that, 9-11, well, then prior to that was the USS Cole. Hmm. I gave that document to some very high-ranking people that were flag officers at the time. I said, what does this mean to you? And they go, first question was, how in the hell did you get that? <laughs> they asked me, and uh, they said, he's absolutely talking about the USS Cole and 9-11 that he knew this stuff was coming. He may not know the exact date, but he knew more about it because he goes into detail talking to the prime minister. Anyway, I've been trying to get those other documents and uh, I've got the Office of uh, Government Information Services on my side. They're trying to get it. They've been trying to get these for a number of years now. And they have flat out told me, said the National Security Council and the State Department are refusing. They don't want this information. Out. And it's plus, Bill Clinton has to personally approve its release. And he said he's not going to do it. And, so and then you, you have to ask why. You have that in your what? book. So which, which book do you have that in? That's in Secrets, Lies, and Deception. Okay. That was the book that came out about two years ago and was covered on Fox News and everything. Uh, but I'm still fighting for those. And the big question is, why is Bill Clinton refusing to release those? Why? What's he covering up? And I think I already know, uh, but I want to see it, his transcripts and the other documents on it. So, Mike, what can you tell us about the E. Howard Hunt and uh, McCord being down there? What were their uh, duties? Well, they were, you know, working quite for quite some time uh, for Ehrlichman and the White House. And uh, they were down there snooping around under assumed names. And who knows how many assumed names, but uh, the one main guy was uh, Jack Caulf Caulfield, who earlier when I mentioned that White House memo, he's the one that wrote it. And he was basically, um, for a better term, in charge of them, telling them what to do and where to go. And uh, they were very interested in getting more and more information on Chappaquiddick as time went by. And also they were also trying at the same time, trying to bug McGovern uh, because they were thinking that down the line, he's going to run. Well, you know, he ended up running and uh, they were looking at bugging his offices too. But uh, the whole thing was just to get as much information on Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, so that they could leak it to the media and just do a wonderful job at destroying him 
Uh, now, at that stage, they didn't need to do a lot because Teddy Kennedy was destroying himself. Uh, but they wanted to make sure they had all the nails in the coffin. And so they were gathering all the information they possibly could. Yeah, and Hunt was actually sending letters to the, the Senate uh, Ethics Committee, something like that, uh, and telling him about perjury, that he was committing perjury in his uh, transcripts down at the hearing, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, exactly uh, what names he was using at different times, because <laughs> he was also sending the same sort of information to the uh, what Jack Anderson was a columnist back then, okay. and to various publications, various news organizations. And uh, also Hoover was very interested because he was collecting all of this himself. And I've got documents that he was just setting back, getting all this information and saying to himself, no matter who wins, Nixon or Kennedy, I'm set for life, you know, in the FBI, because he had enough to bury both of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was really, it, when you look at it and you start going through it, there's a lot of very, very interesting information. And all the players uh, basically trying to get enough information to screw the other guy. Yeah, they're all blackmailing each other. The always play. They're all blackmailing. I mean, they're all blackmailing each other. Everybody's yeah. sticking up there on the other one. I said, oh, my God. That's yeah, it. and, you know, Hoover was the master of it, but uh, what well, was it's kind of a little sideline, but with an LAPD intelligence, Hoover would go out to uh, Del Mar Racetrack, uh, and he would bring Clyde with him, Clyde Tolson, the number two guy at the FBI. That was his lover. And so what would happen, he would go out there, and Hoover was a heavy better, and he would go to the track in Del Mar and bet, and he would lose, like most people do, right? He would lose. Sure. But he was never forced to pay what he lost. The mob guys from San Diego and LA, they would take care of all of his losses and they would pay for a lot of stuff. And so LAPD intelligence knew about it. And I saw the photos. And at the time, Del Mar was very secluded along the beaches. So Hoover and Clyde went for a nice romantic walk one afternoon along the beach and they thought they were in a private area and they were showing their affection to each other. And L- LAPD tells us back of snapping away the photographs. And so it just shows you that Hoover even thought he was he was safe when he was out there, but he wasn't. Another little thing about Hoover showed the documents is that when they came out, they would secretly go down to Tijuana, Mexico, where you could buy anything. And you still can buy anything. And what it implied to the LAPD intelligence report that Hoover was going down there to have some flings with some boys, mm. him and Tolson. Um, that was never confirmed, but it was in the intelligence reports on Hoover. Uh, so, yeah, they're all they're all pretty much cut from the same cloth, uh, everybody let, back in D.C. like that. Let me ask you real quick, because uh, uh, you got uh, McCord being involved and Hunt being involved, all these dirty tricksters and stuff like that. And then you hear these stories, uh, what was his name, G. Gordon Lydon talking about, how they had these plans to, to like dose protesters with LSD and then make them confused, put on, put LSD on their steering wheel and stuff. Do you think it's possible that they could have, and, and May Brussel has this theory too, I'm from May Brussel, uh, that uh, perhaps Nixon's dirty tricksters somehow got there ahead of Kennedy and dosed him or, or got him stoned on some, put some drugs in his uh, beer or something and staged this accident. Um, I'm, I'm sure somebody would come up with that that theory, uh, I, I don't think so, though. Okay. I, I just don't, I don't think so. I mean, this is just Ted doing his thing with his buddies, and they all got drunk, and they may have had some drugs out of themselves that they brought, and uh, he was just going out for a ride, take Mary Jo to a nice, quiet location, secluded, and he was going to try to do what he was going to do, and instead, he was spooked when he saw that police car, and he sped out of there, and he went off the bridge. And then the cover-up had to start at that stage. Okay, and you have some stories about uh, Ted Kennedy's parties? Because you only got like 10 minutes left. Uh, Ted Kennedy's parties on Capitol Hill that he would uh, lock yeah. the offices kind of when he got there. Yeah, well, the, once again, that came from uh, the LAPD intelligence reports and also from uh, some guys we knew who were working FBI intelligence at the time and also out of uh, the D.C. Police Department. And what they said is, uh, well, he was the... Uh, probably the most powerful senator at the time, and everybody knew him. And so on weekends, when the Capitol was closed, 
the Capitol Police are there and they 